far from being James Madison's own position, much less Thomas Jefferson's. James Madison wrote one of his most famous papers, the so-called Memorial of Remonstrance, to help disestablish the Anglican Church in Virginia, because he thought that the truths of faith could not be determined in the political process by majority vote. And therefore, that religion, or more precisely the churches, had to be separated from government, and government separated from the churches. The right of conscience, as they called it in those days, the right to pursue religious truth and worship God in an agreeably to your own lights, that they didn't think was a natural right, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But a natural right is a right that reason can discern. It doesn't take revelation to know it. The fact that we can know moral truths, like what our rights are, helps us to see that religion can also be true. We can compare religions one with the other as to whether or not they live up to what we know to be true from reason. You can weigh a religion, for example, does, does a religion persecute the innocent? Does it, uh, does it offend against ordinary decency? Does it practice child sacrifice or rights like that? Uh, one can imagine all kinds of uncivilized practices going under the name of religion. But the fact that we know that human beings are equal, that they have rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, helps us to say that some religion is seen uh, outside the pale. Seem, in fact, to be immoral for all the pretended uh, belief that their that their adherents may express. It. So let me now mention one last obstacle to understanding these building blocks, fundamental building blocks of American government: the problem of tradition or culture. A lot of people say today that there are no truths outside. Of or tradition. That, that is, that something calling itself a self-evident truth is really evident only to, say, the Anglo-Americans of the late 18th century, or maybe even only to the Anglo-American Protestants of that era. This is the thesis of a, of a book by a very renowned writer, political scientist, a few years ago, Samuel Huntington, who wrote a book called Who Are We? The book was about immigration, but it began with a long description of what he called Anglo Protestantism. And his view was that these truths of the Declaration of Independence were not true truths, they were Anglo Protestant truths. They were beliefs, things held sincerely by people in Britain and people descended from them in, the, uh, in North America. Today's postmodern left would add that it's not just Anglo American Protestants for whom these were true, but white male property, sexist, racist, and homophobic, homophobic Anglo-American Protestants who believe in these truths. And according to this argument, what you have to do to correct for their parochialism is to make civic education and every other form of education multicultural. That is, the oppressed cultures, or the allegedly oppressed cultures, have to get equal time with the oppressors. But why? I think that's a legitimate question to ask. Why? Why would you want to simply have a parade of cultures, no one of which is apparently intrinsically true or better than the others, but simply to gratify everyone in the possible audience that their part of the spectrum has been covered? Why would you take any cultures seriously? Unless there's something valuable in them, something that both oppressors and oppressed alike could profit from, some truth or wisdom that all citizens, maybe all human beings, need to know. But if that's the case, then we should ask what those truths are that we need to know, not where they come from, what's their cultural origins or their geographical origins. It would be absurd to confine truth to the place it originates, or the culture from which it uh, originates, as it would be to say, not study geometry, but study Greek geometry. Or not study algebra, but study Arabic algebra. 
since geometry basically comes from Euclid, and the Greeks, and algebra comes from the Arabs. So, if we can get past these obstacles to taking the founding seriously, we are back to that initial statement about self-evident truths. What I want you to do now in just a few minutes is to show you why Madison and Jefferson uh, thought those truths were, in fact, self-evident. Uh, to show you why I think it's quite conceivable for us to believe in them just as sincerely and deeply as the Founding Fathers themselves believed in them, despite the fact that they were enunciated more than two centuries ago. So, excuse me for a moment while I commit some philosophy. You know, self-evident truth has a technical definition. It's, uh, it's a truth in which the predicate or the thing that comes after the word, you know, is already contained in the subject of the sentence. So, for example, this proposition, that the whole is greater than one part of it, that the whole, W-H-O-L-E, is greater than one part of it, that is a self-evident truth. Because if you say whole, you already know, you already imply that any part of it has got to be smaller than the whole. A self-evident truth, in other words, doesn't teach you anything, since the predicate really just restates what's already contained in the subject. Who says the whole implies that which contains all the parts and is greater than any one of those parts. Similarly, another proposition. Here's another example of a self-evident proposition. Uh, man is a rational animal. Uh, it's a traditionally regarded as a self-evident proposition. That is, saying, adding rational animal doesn't change your understanding of man. Know what human beings are, you recognize them as rational animals. Now, of course, you have to have some experience with human beings. Self evident propositions are not the conclusion of an argument, but they presuppose you have some knowledge of what the subject is. So, if you were, if you had never seen a human being, if you had no experience with human beings, you would not know that man is a rational animal. So, if you were a uh, Vulcan or a rookie, uh, or any other sort of exotic uh, alien creature who had never yet come across the human species, that proposition that as a rational animal would not be intelligent to you. You wouldn't understand it. Though, once you met some human beings, you would recognize them as rational animals too, just like Vulcans, or uh, I guess, are these rational animals? I guess they are. <laughs> they don't speak a lot, but they growl very well. What about our proposition then? All men are created equal. It's self-evident because who says all men already says created equal. That is, every human being is equally a human being. That's what that proposition really means. Every human being is equally a human being. Every member of the species is equally a member of the species. In logical form, that proposition is no different from saying all goldfish are created equal. Every goldfish is equally a goldfish. Some may be uh, shorter, some longer, some may swim faster, some slower, some may be more mobile, others less golden in color. But these are all secondary differences. Each one is what it is, primarily a goldfish. To say all men are created equal is to say all men, all human beings, are exactly that. They're equally members of the human species. Of course, all the difference in the world comes from the difference between being a goldfish and a human being. To know, to be a rational animal allows you to have rights and duties, of course, whereas goldfish are, or irrational animals, are incapable of such, of bearing such rights uh, and duties, such moral responsibilities. Now, that's, that's the end of the philosophy lesson. Uh, but that's really all it means. But it is, I think, a rational self-evident truth is obviously true to us now as it was to 